Hello everybody. This is the lecture Rule Development and Resource Oriented Sanitation. I'll give an overview on the whole class. So this will cover the whole range of issues and it may be a bit overwhelming at the beginning, but this is to show you the full scope of uh, well, all the great options we have, all the great development that is going on in different parts of the world. So just enjoy and uh, you can also like stop in between and uh, I will just go through but it's in your hands to to stop and uh, re rehearse a bit. All right, so my, my name is Ralf Otterpohl. I'm the director of the Institute of Wastewater Management and Water Protection at Hamburg University of Technology in Northern Germany. So uh, this lecture will be uh, about systems thinking. And uh, if you solve all the major, major problems together, uh, it becomes a lot easier. It, experience shows that if you work with one single issue, it doesn't really go very far. But if you look at all, all of, them, of them together, that's uh, highly synergistic and change can take place. And so uh, I'll talk about soil red regeneration. And this is the number one issue of all, number one. Uh, regenerative agriculture, this is one of the ways to um, make soil reg uh, regeneration happen on a large scale it's possible even on a on a massive scale all around the world and then we need lots of people doing this so we need uh, more family farms more people in um yeah in a position to really keep the soil intact and so on uh, then we have the topic of resource or uh, resources oriented sanitation and finally rural and the city this should be a win-win situation if rural areas go on to be depleted and population lost uh, there is not much hope for a good future because we need to develop the rural areas and um, only then cities can survive in a good way all right, so um, if we look at the situation that we have, we are basically running into a situation where we are creating a desert planet. Um, but fortunately, there are more and more restoration projects. So I think we can turn that around and move towards uh, uh, even greener earth, earth is still pretty green, um, but we need to do restoration of a massive uh, scale. And I'll show you how this can be done in uh, different aspects. So, yeah, and uh, all the talk about overpopulation, um, that is outright ridiculous because uh, if we manage our planet in a good way, even 30 billion people could have a good life on earth uh, so that's something where propaganda should not be mixed with uh, facts so there is enough for everybody and uh, if we develop our planet in a way that it's serving humans it's serving nature uh, then we can have very good cooperation and many people can live very well not meaning that there should be 30 billion, but even that wouldn't be a problem. Even that extreme number wouldn't be a problem. We feed 70 billion animals in, in lousy cages and, and so on. Uh, so 70 billion people uh, could be fed by the food that is put into industrial uh, uh, animal uh, husbandry. All right. so. Now, we do have uh, living soils, so that's the center of all. And if we look around, we have all these issues um, that are to be addressed. So um, there is this interaction that we need. And uh, if we really look at all these issues and look at the sustainable 
development goals uh, of the UN. Uh, we cover quite a few in uh, what we have in our rural development class. So we can see that we are dealing with uh, very, very many of the issues. And um, this is something what is really nice because uh, once again, this shows if all the problems are solved, Together, this is more simple. All right, so first uh, chapter, soil regeneration. Uh, if we look at um, the present state of the soils around the world, um, the well situation is not very positive, to say the least. So we have an enormous uh, amount of soil degradation and we do see that this is really all around the world. So we, we do have this not only in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we see a lot of uh, soil depletion in, in uh, well most regions of the world. And uh, of course, degradation is defined by something getting worse. So in areas where the soil was already very weak uh, all along, you don't see um, worsening. Uh, loss of soil fertility, it's slow but dramatic. It is happening on a global scale. And counteraction is the key issue for a good future for all and helps to balance the climate. So some numbers uh, humans have strongly deteriorated or destroyed one third of all fertile soils around the world and uh, this is showing that um, well we, we have messed it up we we have been led into wrong pathways um, that are not taking into consideration the survival of the planet itself um, but that has started a few decades ago and all these efforts are sort of maturing and so I'm basically I've become very very positive that we get this going and you will understand this um, when you follow this lecture. So uh, one of the main um, reasons for all the soil degradation uh, besides deforestation um, is agrochemical industry. It is an absurd fight against nature. Uh, it does not make sa any sense at all, except in saving on labor, or it makes and made millions and millions of jobs disappear. Uh, it is only a, well, clever, <laughs> that's not uh, to be ta taken seriously, but parasitic business model. It destroys soil life and pollutes the groundwater, makes insects and birds disappear. And uh, well, we are on the way to be uh, disappearing as well if we don't take action on this. Um, it's tragedy for human health. Chronic illness is rampant and there are very clear connections to agrochemical uh, agriculture. If this agrochemical uh, type of agriculture is stopped, farmers can earn more money. And uh, this is something where I will show you many of the good solutions. Agrochemicals applied must prove to be safe in all aspects. Um, of course, we have the illegal logging. So this is a picture I have taken in Ethiopia. And as you see, this is a nice truck. So it's not the poor people only that do this. It's uh, uh, mafia structures that are just uh, clear cutting the forest, leaving, uh, well, dead areas. And of course, there is no more water regeneration in such places. So this must stop. This is unacceptable. And uh, it kills many people by creating floodings, droughts, and famine. So this is a major crime. It's not just stealing 
uh, woods. It's it's a major crime. Um, all right. So um, even Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, has run into severe uh, uh, problems with water, and it's also mentioned that it's um, the deforestation by agribusiness uh, has depleted the rainfalls and um, now uh, there are years where Sao Paulo is, is in uh, absolute uh, drought conditions but the uh, other phase of uh, well destroyed land is flooding so it's sometimes flooding and sometimes uh, drought. So then the other issue, uh, too many free grazing animals eat too many plants, less protection for the soil, uh, erosion and degradation. So of course this is something that is going on, but it's not really only the fault of the animals as we will see later. Now to the positive parts. Uh, Soil, genera soil regeneration happens around the world and, and this is something what is great. It's absolutely fantastic to see how many great projects are developing, how those projects that have been started long time ago are spreading out, being copied. And um, also there are huge government programs, uh, but uh, it seems that those things that are started by people from the region and being embedded in the region often uh, are a lot more sustainable. Um, soil regeneration is feasible and can contribute to prosperity. Uh, reforestation sometimes against people uh, and that should be considered. So that's something what, what should not happen uh, by reforestation and, and kicking people out as sometimes done. Uh, then we do have forest gardens, agroforestry. That is a big trend in agriculture, combining the um, well, agriculture with uh, having rows of trees. And I personally prefer those types of agroforestry that produces food and fodder and not only uh, fuel as uh, wood harvest. One of the key issues is rainwater harvesting. That's at the well, forefront of restoring degraded areas or also converting uh, natural step into um, green productive areas. And that goes hand in hand with regenerative agriculture. We can work with animals very well and so that would be the rotational grazing. We need a lot more family farms and they produce 70% of the global food today. It's the family farms, not the industrial farms that feed the world. So we need more small scale and this is giving good um, opportunities for local people can restore the soil and uh, all in all uh, this can lead to something like permaculture gardening working a lot with perennial plants not only having uh, well plants that you have to seed every year and that are uh, threatened by weeds but uh, the perennial uh, food production like also in agroforestry and forest gardens can go a long way. So some of the amazing success stories. So um, restoration is often started with visionaries and rebels initially laughed at. Some are fought, some have been in prison and um, but some changed the face of the earth. And um, there is uh, the famous uh, Green Belt movement uh, that has developed from Kenya. And it was uh, to a large extent by uh, the amazing work from, of uh, Wangara Matai. And she has really uh, well started very small with uh, planting uh, trees and convincing people that only by planting trees they will have um, 
fuel for their uh, cooking stoves and only when they have fuel for the cooking stoves then they can be uh, eating uh, in a proper way because that region of the world is uh, dependent on or mainly depends on foods that need to to be cooked um, and um, she has a quote here it is the people who must save the environment it is the people who must make their leaders change and we cannot be intimidated so we must stand up for what we believe in and uh, that's something what was um, in a time where there were lots of attacks on uh, this movement um, um, and despite all the threats by uh, the, the government at that time uh, totalitarian government they were pushing through and this is true for all the things that we want to do we have to stand up for them uh, because very often there are conflicting interests uh, in people in government and power and so um, people themselves should be clear about how they want to develop the future and for that they need to be informed about the options and this is something what is part of what we are doing here then uh, another amazing success story uh, this is by Mr. Uh, uh, Sabadogo from uh, Burkina Faso. So uh, he started uh, by uh, doing something what it, his grandfather had, uh, had told him. So whenever there was a little um, seedling of a tree coming up, he would uh, make a little uh, swale or put some stones so that the little rain that is falling in the region is hold back right where this seedling is growing and he was putting some uh, well dung from the uh, from, from the animals and um, that was sort of helping trees to develop and uh, he developed many trees on his piece of land and the neighbors were not only laughing at him but they were openly opposing him threatening him his first forest was uh, burned down even uh, so just imagine how how crazy people's behavior can be but he was uh, insisting he just went on without blaming anybody he was just showing uh, a good example and he could show that where trees were growing his vegetables were developing much better because they had some shade the water was uh, restored by the trees and so on and um, so this became a huge success story and a lot of barren land in uh, sub-saharan africa was converted by his example and he uh, won the right livelihood award in 2018 uh, and so uh, it's great that he could um, really also um, well get some recognition for what he has done so this is some text if you want to look at that you can stop there and there is also some more material found about this um, amazing man one of my heroes yeah, another uh, person who has had a lot of impact on uh, well the development of um, of the world. Uh, this is uh, Tony Rinodo, and he developed something what he called greening Africa with a pocket pocket knife. So with deforestation, we often see that uh, trees are cut down for either for fuel or uh, construction material or stolen by people that produce uh, charcoal for uh, Europe or something and typically when these uh, trees are cut down many of those will come back so they will be pushing from this from um, what remains but then uh, danger so they will eat this down continuously and nothing will develop and uh, 
Tony Rinaldo said, okay, you cut away all the branches uh, except of one or two, then you build protection around with like thorny bushes, bushes or some fencing. And only when uh, this tree is out of reach for uh, grazing animals, uh, the, the battle is won. And with that, uh, also large areas were uh, changed. And um, it may be surprising, but um, this was really, uh, well, not only not supported by uh, governments at the time, but these corrupt politicians, they even um, tried to, uh, well, make this uh, uh, disappear because they earned big money with uh, huge reforestation programs where the money was flowing, follow up often not done. So many of the trees were just put into savanna and died off as soon as they uh, had been exposed to the weather for a few months. And uh, these projects that come from people, work with people and bring income to the local population, uh, they are sustainable and they can really go very well. And uh, luckily, uh, this was pushing through and has also contributed to uh, the improvement, the, the, the quite su substantial improvements of the soil situation in Sub-Sahara Africa. So now back to the grazing animals, because they are known to destroy soil. And that's right if they are mismanaged. Um, so uh, all the big mainstream beliefs are often wrong or uh, give a wrong impression. And uh, if these animals uh, are mismanaged, that they just run around and eat everything down, no wonder that it's destroying. But there are other ways. So there is the uh, holistic plant grazing or rotational grazing. And one of the key figures here uh, was and is Alan Savory from the Savory Institute. And um, uh, he and his team, they have developed uh, grazing patterns. Basically, these are also existing in uh, traditional agriculture. Also in Germany, I know a farmer who does this since like uh, 40 years. So the idea is uh, if you have animals running around everywhere, they will be um, eating from everything a bit. Uh, its diversity will be less because they only eat their preferred uh, 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 herbs. Uh, so then if you make uh, the patch smaller, there is time for the regeneration of the rest of the fields. And so if you make this even smaller, so maybe even into one day portions, then you have intense uh, grazing. They eat something from everything, but uh, they are uh, brought into the next uh, plot uh, even before everything is, is destroyed. And uh, that's intensive, uh, well, uh, um, like uh, fertilizing of, of this ground and, well, the dung is trampled into the ground and then before damage is done, uh, the animals go on to the, to the next uh, plot. All right, so uh, I'll show you some examples. So the, 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 some of the reasons for the improvements in Sub-Sahara Africa, I've shown you, Mr. Savadago and Tono Rinodo. Uh, but there are also other examples. And so one of the big examples is the Lost Plateau in China. And it used to look like that, completely degraded, and there was not very much uh, going on there anymore. And with that uh, situation, there was a lot of, uh, well, erosion. The Yellow River is yellow because of all the loss that is washing down these uh, plots. People had to leave because there is nothing to live on. 
and uh, with like building uh, lots of uh, terraces planting many 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 trees millions and millions of trees in an area as big as belgium and uh, so that has developed in a way that after 10 years time a uh, picture uh, from the same plot uh, this looks like this now so this is just stunning how all this can be done and now people are coming back from the cities because they see okay that's nice again here my my plot is alive again and so um, there's documentary that i strongly recommend we have also worked in this, so also making uh, such uh, trenches. This is a key line system where the water is brought from where there is too much in the gullies uh, out into the shoulders of the land. And with that, uh, in the rainy season, this water is kept back and can uh, seep into the ground here and be even there in the dry season and uh, then uh, things grow back and uh, then you can get in planting trees like the uh, moringa trees that are excellent food and uh, also pretty drought resistant um, yeah then there is stunning examples from uh, india uh, so uh, there is uh, some development that was pushed by a famous actor in India and he saw where the de degradation is, 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 is uh, leading the country and he has started a, a competition. He has formed the Pani Foundation and he has started the Water Cup and um, the challenge was to build as many rainwater harvesting structures um, in 45 days as possible and so people have built many many structures and through the competition that was people participated and it was sportive uh, fun and the success of this is just overwhelming so there's huge areas of land have been restored and still are and many other villages are inspired by this and this is the homework to watch this video it's just 11 minutes but it's just uh, giving so much hope and these are the vid videos by Andrew uh, Millison who has also a lot more on, on great projects and also on uh, rainwater harvesting all right so um, approximately 40 percent of the global land area is considered dry land so there is a big margin of improvement and uh, so many more areas can become uh, fertile and productive and, and very green and restoring the water and balancing climate. We know how it can be done. It's efficient. It's enormously um, cost uh, efficient um, and it's benefiting the people and uh, maybe that's something uh, why this is not done in a gr uh, bigger scale because it's like um, corporations have a lot of power to roll out their uh, programs and interests but um, when it comes to what is good for local people they don't have a big voice in many places and so that's why i'm so happy that so many absolutely stunning projects are developed by uh, people by well-known and not at all known people from communities and spreading this development as i said i'm really optimistic um, so uh, humus this is something where we have a, a key thing so the living soil uh, humus this is something where we need to be uh, well starting so if there is no humus in the soil uh, there cannot be living soils and uh, so much is linked to that so if we have uh, humus we have reduced erosion it's a biofilter for groundwater water storage improved water cycle storage and slow release of nutrients and carbon if humus is well fed it feeds the plants aeration of the soil 
and good yields and healthy crops. So all the trace elements should be there in uh, the system to be productive and then in turn it makes very, very healthy um, uh, food. So this would be um, soil that has been depleted by uh, plowing and also by biocides that are killing off the soil life, fungicides killing off the mycorrhizal network. And so this soil equates to like uh, roof tiles a bit. Uh, to the contrary, if we have soil that is managed in such a way, this is like a sponge and that's what we want. Good soil prevents droughts and flooding. And that's uh, where we uh, go. Soil restoration is the key and making soils alive again can be done. So um, if you like, you can make a, a short uh, stop here and uh, well rehearse a bit. Then you make more use of your time. Things normally leave our uh, short-term memory after around 20 minutes so it's good to make short breaks and like uh, rehearse what you have heard uh, so that's something where uh, I encourage you to do so um, and as you can do this just uh, by a click and uh, stopping uh, this is something what uh, I, I really uh, well, we'll leave up to you. Um, I will go on with uh, regenerative agriculture. And uh, this is, well, a big success story also. So there are 10,000 of farms that have converted. And um, so this is spreading very, very fast because people see how they can get back into uh, high yield production and so on. So I'll explain this. Um, good soil is uh, supported by organic agriculture. Um, but I have to say organic agriculture is often still plowing and we need to go to no-till and cut down on chemicals at the same time. So in my point of view, all agriculture should go for regenerative agriculture. Organic agriculture should get away from uh, tillage or plowing. And um, one of the things that we can see is the enormous development of organic agriculture. So according to FAO, um, I'll open, so, um, Organic agriculture has risen from below 0.5% of the uh, share of agricultural land globally to, well, around 1.5 now. And while this is a big step forward, it still shows that this is only a minority of the farmers that are working in that way. But uh, this doesn't really include all the regenerative farmers that are also often not using uh, um, agrochemical products uh, that much anymore, if at all. And uh, so this is something where we can really hope that this development is much uh, further, and it actually is, especially in uh, uh, North America, there is a lot of development that goes into the right direction. And um, this is um, some examples, increasing humus content with highly productive regenerative agriculture. Um, one of the uh, well uh, pioneers in this field is uh, Gabe Brown. And Gabe Brown had taken over a huge farm in North Dakota one of the most difficult climates of the world. So if, it's can, if, if it can be done there, it can be done almost everywhere. And uh, he had his failure. So the farm was with, well, agrochemical operation. It was near 
bankruptcy, so he was very close to losing his land. And uh, luckily, he was very um, inventive, so he looked what is there. He got some good advice uh, by uh, the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture with a program that was encouraging humus building. And so now after 20 years, he has clearly shown that even under very, very harsh conditions, um, regenerative agriculture can be done. And uh, David Montgomery from Berkeley University has uh, researched what is done. And after his famous book, Dirt, where he showed that most huge civilizations uh, on Earth have been destroyed or destroyed themselves to quite a large extent by destroying their soils. And we have been on the pathway to repeat that. But uh, luckily, this time we have internet, we can exchange on ideas, we learn from each other. And I think we are headed into a good direction, but a lot more support is needed so that uh, well, finally, we will get to uh, the green planet and not to the desert planet. What could still happen because it's so profitable to destroy. Destruction is very, very profitable for very few. And restoration is very, very profitable for all. <laughs> all right. So uh, look at the videos uh, by, by Gabe Brown and David Montgomery. Um, and... Uh, now some examples. So why am I so optimistic? <laughs> so around 20 years back, uh, I was um, doing some work in Indonesia and uh, I met a person who had been involved in uh, dry rice production. I was very surprised at the time. Rice was always uh, party rice for me, uh, so flooded fields. but um rice doesn't even uh like to be submerged it can um uh, it's done for weed control and some other reasons but it doesn't make too much sense uh, because it takes up too much water and so there is the system of rice intensification that was partly developed also by professor uh, mubiar at uh, itb bandung in indonesia and the idea is to, to grow rice dry, make wider spacing and to put compost to it. It's an organic system and it's uh, very efficient. So that's a farm that I visited. They use a lot of uh, compost. And um, so at the time I've been there, there was a huge flooding uh, before I came. And all the party fields were gone, so they, they were out of operation and only the dry rice was surviving the flooding. Uh, and so that's also showing the resilience of this system. And uh, SRI rice has won, I think, two or three times the world record of productivity. And from our institute, we are uh, working on a project in northern India for SRI, combining this with intercropping. So if you put... Uh, beans to the, uh, they are not red, obviously, but just to show you, uh, you will have a, a nitrogen fixing plant that can uh, well be synergistic. And that project has uh, won an award from uh, Organic Farming Association. All right, so um, that shows how much can be done. So rice is a big staple food around the world and it can be produced with much, much less water. All right, um, rainwater harvesting. There are many techniques to supply rainwater collected from surfaces. Um, we are more talking about uh, the um, catchment uh, area, not so much the rooftop stuff. Uh, and a lot can be done there. And um, however, before you start with anything like that, look at the overall situation. Topography, soil quality, is it more spongy or is it rock? Uh, look for slopes. Is there illegal logging, destructive grazing? Change that to other patterns. 
So it's not just making swales and um, uh, uh, also some, some uh, reservoirs, but it's also looking at the overall situation. Um, and uh, plants are crucial. So the plants, um, if they are growing in the ground, water will, no, that's water is blue or should be, uh, should seep in while in soil without vegetation cover, the water will either run off or evaporate and it's not present in the uh, dry times. And so that's the key issue, vegetation cover. And trees are great at that. Um, and uh, this is something what can be done. Now making, um, well, some, some barriers to prevent erosion can uh, turn this place into very productive uh, areas, holding back the water, retention and so on. Uh, there is also like these check dams that make uh, the places uh, productive and uh, so all in all if you start trees you can uh, plant trees with uh, substrates from uh, from uh, sanitation for example terrapeta compost from bio waste and sanitation because to start you need some organic material. If there is only barren land, that's very, very difficult. But if you have such substrates, uh, that's very nice. And then uh, you would plant like Moringa trees for uh, building the soil and also for fodder. It's food and fodder of the best quality. And uh, then you would pen up the goats so that they don't uh, destroy the land. You can feed them with um, the leaves of Moringa and other trees. And uh, so that's a great system. Um, so once again, short rehearsal break. Um, just click on stop if you like. Um, but I will make another file to not being uh, running too long with this one. And uh, after the break, we will move into the important role of family farms. All right, that's for now. Once again, let's solve all the major problems together and it becomes much more simple. Not saying it is simple, but everything is there and it's a win, 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 win situation. So thank you very much for now. See you for the next part.